Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and as always, I'm joined in studio today by President Wyatt. Hello, Scott. Hello, Steve. It's a great day today. Thanks. So we're on book two of our summer book challenge, and uh, we had a little teaser for it. We're studying the book 1984 by George Orwell, and we're hoping at least that our audience has now read the book, and we've invited a couple of guest experts to come in and join us and offer their insights into the book. And would you take a few minutes to introduce them? Yeah, let's start with you, Joy. So Joy Sarantino, um, faculty member, at SUU in the English department, teaches literature, and 1984 is a book you regularly teach. Yes. Um, And earlier this month, we had a chance to visit with you briefly about this book, but why don't you tell us what is it about dystopian novels that pulls you in? Uh, Dystopian novels is one of my areas of study from a master's degree, and I... 1984 specifically was the book that got me into this genre, and now that people have read it, I can actually explain why. It was the first book that I'd ever read where the protagonist didn't win, and I was dumbfounded by that when I read it for the first time. I can't remember how old I was. It might have been sixth grade or something like that, maybe seventh grade, and I was so dumbfounded by the fact that they didn't win and that it was going to continue in this terrible state and nobody could do anything about it, that I was just drawn into that, as difficult as it was to read. I was fascinated with that idea. Yeah, it. Um, we don't really like stories without happy endings, do we? Yeah, which is funny because I read these kind of <laughs> books all the time. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm very frustrated at the end. <laughs> and uh, we're also joined by Doug Bennett. Doug, you um, have been the department chair in our political science department. Yes. But that's really not the story about Doug Bennett, because you've spent a whole career in Washington, D.C. Um, why don't you give us just a little bit of an introduction to your life? Well, I, I'm a graduate of the University of Utah College of Law, and following law school, I accepted a position in the U.S. House of Representatives as counsel for the Committee on Energy and Commerce. And I was there working on trade issues, consumer protection issues. I was the lead Republican counsel for NAFTA uh, and also the Common Sense Product Liability Act of 1995, which was the first uh, tort reform to pass both houses of Congress. And then it went down the avenue and President Clinton vetoed it. But it was fun to work on and get it, get it through the Congress. And then uh, I got married and I left Capitol Hill and became a lobbyist uh, for a small lobbying firm called Public Strategies. And I went from public strategies to uh, one of D.C.'s premier lobbying firms, Timmons & Company, where I was executive vice president uh, before joining the Liberty Mutual Group as vice president of international government affairs. And I was with Liberty for 10 years and spent the latter part of my career with Liberty in Asia much of the time trying to get licenses in Vietnam and China. And then after you spent that career, um, you and your wife retired to Southern Utah. Yes. And and then joined our faculty. Yes. Retirement was a little different than I expected. Uh, (laughs) After about six weeks, I started looking around thinking, what am I going to do today? And (laughs) (laughs) so uh, I was delighted at the chance to, to teach political science at SUU. It's been a wonderful thing. I think this is a great group to talk about this book with because we've got um, a literature expert, uh, a government expert. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, Doug, you've already mentioned that you um, served in Republican spots and joy. 
Um, you wouldn't describe yourself as a Republican? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't always either. <laughs> <laughs> well, every once in a while, I, I wonder, you know, what, what parties what. These labels don't always right. uh, work for us. But, but I think it's fair to say that, uh, Doug, you tend to be more conservative, and Joy, you tend to be more liberal. Yes. Uh, politically. And, uh, and so here we are with this broad group discussion of the book 1984 and um, Winston Smith, mm-hmm. who doesn't win in the end. Um, in a really spectacular way. In a he spectacular win. way. Yeah. Yeah. In a really awful <laughs> way. Well, why is this book so important um, for us today? Well, I'll start. Um, this book... Uh, is a warning um like the book that actually influenced orwell to write this book was uh, a book called we we by uh, yajevni zamiatin and he wrote a book it's not exactly the same but that the the buildings were all clear so you could always be seen everybody was labeled with a number there was a lot of controlling of nature um and when he wrote that he was trying to, to warn russia about the way com- you know, communism was coming and that it was really bad. And and people wouldn't listen to him. People, the average person in the community just kind of laughed at him and the government didn't. And they kind of ruined his career and tried to get rid of all the copies of this book. Um, and he ended up exiled for the rest of his life. Um, but so the Orwell was basing it on that. So there was a book that was specifically trying to warn people about a specific government. And so Orwell said, well, well, what would happen if we did this? You know, what, what would happen if this happened in the part of the world that we think this can't happen in? Uh, so he wrote 1984. And you know, the point of this, a lot of the point of it, we see it from Winston's point of view, and he's actually part of the small percentage of the population. So we, we relate to Winston because he's the protagonist, but really most of us are not part of that society. We'd essentially be the proles. And one of the main points is the book is the proles, the majority of the people have a lot of power, but they have no idea that they do and that they could elicit change if they just realized it. They have more power than they perceive. Yeah, that's really interesting. Doug, what would you say is the um, one of the main reasons why we should be interested in this book today? I think the book reflects a reality that I slowly came to uh, grips with in D.C. And the the message of the book, I've, you've identified me as a conservative. I used to be a very idealistic, young neo-socialist. And uh, then I moved to Washington and started working in government. And then I started traveling the world and seeing these places where these wonderful ideas were put into practice. And it never quite works out the way it's intended for the proles, but it always works out the way it's intended for the folks at the top. And that's because, this is what I've learned, and this is an excerpt from the book. I always thought government existed to help the poor, the homeless, the needy, to provide opportunities. Here's what I learned, and here's what Orwell captured so succinctly. Quote, The party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others. We are interested solely in power. Not wealth or luxury or long life or happiness. Only power. Pure power. We are different from the oligarchies of the past in that we know what we're doing. All the others were cowards and hypocrites. The Nazis and the Russian communists came close to us in their methods but never had the courage to recognize their own motives. They pretended, perhaps even believed, that they had seized power unwillingly and for a limited time, and just round the corner there lay a paradise where human beings would be free and equal. We are not like that. We know that no one ever seizes power with the intention of relinquishing it. Power is not a means. It is an end. One does not establish dictatorship in order to safeguard a revolution. One makes revolution in order to establish dictatorship. That's what I learned about power in Washington. So what, um, be more specific. 
I was in Washington in 1994 when the Republicans took over after 40 years in the wilderness. <laughs> they ran on a message of fiscal responsibility, economic almost austerity, a promise to inject some fiscal discipline into the budgeting procedure. I saw with my own eyes as these men and women who I respected and worked for gained the majority and they were like kids who'd been locked out of a candy store. And then suddenly the lock falls off and they walk in and they say, <laughs> my goodness, look at all the candy. Let's give Steve some. Let's give Scott some. Let's give Joy some. And let's keep most of it for ourselves. And that's what happens. Power is an intoxicant and people seek it and become intoxicated and then continue seeking it for its intoxicating effects. Power absolutely corrupts. Yeah, I do believe that. I still am idealistic in the, the idea of like a democratic socialism. Um, but obviously there's been different kinds of socialism where the government obviously is the one that benefits and the people don't benefit, even though they're saying it, that they are benefiting from that. And so, yeah, I do. I, I mean, that's part of one of my problems is personally is that our government, other governments as well, but our government uh, is more of an oligarchy even now. Um, we tend to just say it's a democracy because we've always been saying it's a democracy, but it's not really for the people. And we don't have a lot of control over what actually happens, maybe locally. But as far as like the whole government, we have very little control on what happens. And uh, people don't represent the people or like, you know, elected officials don't. They're supposed to represent the people. But like even I've written senator before and they say, you know, I'm worried about this. Um, and then the, the senator will write me back and say, well, this is what I believe. And I'm, and I'm thinking, no, you represent me. <laughs> you're not, that's not what I'm, I'm not asking you what you believe. I'm telling you what I believe because you're supposed to be representing me and other people like me. The, uh, the fact of the matter is, like the proles, people have tremendous power. Mm -hmm. They choose not to exercise it. Mm -hmm. Unorganized power is impotence. Most Americans don't even vote. Yeah, that kills me. Uh, I used to do a lot of political fundraising. Maybe 3% of Americans will ever make a campaign contribution. People will say to me, there's so much money in politics, it's obscene. And I'll say the federal budget is $3 trillion, and Americans spend 10 times as much on pornography as they do on political campaigns. So you tell me what's important and where we should spend our money. Yeah, and that's interesting. Um, Orwell had something to say about that. Let's see if I can find the quote. Yeah, okay, so I think this is the right one. So long as they, the proles, continue to work and breed, their other activities were th without importance, left to themselves like cattle turned loose. Upon the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern, heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all gambling filled with filled up the horizon of their mind. To keep them in control was not difficult. Uh, and it's interesting because that particular paragraph actually um, summarizes what Brave New World is about, which is essentially what people look at as the opposite of Orwell. Orwell was saying, you know, we're ruling, rule people by fear, and then... Um, and Brave New World is uh, ruled people by pleasure. Um, but this quote in 1984 is essentially saying that if we just keep people distracted enough, you know, they won't pay attention. So if, you know, if I'm, if I'm living paycheck to paycheck or I'm like a v very into, like they say football, but it could be anything, um, where that's where my focus is on these, these little distractions, then I'm not paying attention to the bigger picture, uh, especially if I don't feel like I can do anything about it anyway. But, yeah, it kills me with the voting thing, uh, specifically because it's so easy for us to vote. And it is important. And yet people don't do it. And then uh, I think I had mentioned this last time. In, in some other countries, people will walk for days and be at personal danger to vote. But yet they'll still do it because they don't want to lose that right. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. How much of this is just human nature that um, we don't care or that we're trusting um, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, the trusting thing, I think it used to be 
more like that in the United States, particularly. I think now we have access to a lot of information, even though there's a major issue with people uh, not understanding what a reliable source is. Um, that's a problem because they're like, hey, this says this, and they have no idea where that information actually came from or if that person knows what they're talking about or if it's skewed. But because we have access to information, we're not quite as trusting as we used to be. Um, and I still feel like in, there's a lot of propaganda in America, and I know that makes a lot of people angry. But, you know, I mean, we salute the flag, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not against saluting the flag and things like that. But this is all part of the, hey, America's best, America's best. But there's, you know, there's statistics out there that show you that we're not in a lot of ways, uh, at least anymore. Um, so people just kind of buy into that and then they move on. But there is more of a movement of people going, no, there's some things that need to change. I'm interested in this uh, novel called We, which was written by a Russian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there's a couple angles for this. The The first one is that, and I forgot the name of the author. Zamiatin. Yeah. That's why I forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it took me a while. <laughs> Not so much forgot as can't pronounce. Yeah. Um, so he wrote the book We and found himself in enormous trouble with the government. Yeah. He well, actually had to write Stalin and ask permission to leave. Uh, and I was surprised Stalin actually let him. So he wow. spent most of his life in France and never came back. But, um, yeah, they, the government was pretty mad at him about it. George Orwell wrote 1984 and uh, the government... Did the government do anything at all? I don't think so, because I don't think it was really a comment on what was happening at the time. It was a comment on what, what would happen if we let it get to this point. So there was no threat there, and it wasn't like there was a dictator, you know, in Britain where he was worried about um, repercussions for what he was saying. He was just showing an extreme version, which is what most dystopian literature is. It's an extreme version of what we have now to say, you know, what if it got to this point? I've I've been um, reading books about North Korea and mm -hmm. about African countries, certain African countries, and and what I've read, particularly about North Korea, I thought, wow, this could have been this book, mm -hmm. 1984. That it's just stunning to me uh, how similar it is. Yes. The and, level of surveillance, and in what way? Is oh, it, in, it just, in every single aspect, mm -hmm. yeah. That, that there would be a person in every neighborhood that was responsible for spying on all the neighbors. Yeah. Pictures and, of the dictator everywhere, and you have to profess your love and not even look like you don't love that dictator. That's right. Um, and, you know, that, that's a big part of 1984 is the double think. So it doesn't matter what you actually think as long as it's not showing on your face. And you're not saying it. So you have to believe two things at once. Yeah, it, it, um, it's interesting on the one hand that we think this could never happen in America. The kinds of things we see in North Korea yeah. and other countries around the world and, and this example of Russia. Um, and part of the reason why we think it's less likely to occur here in my mind, is, is this free speech. Mm -hmm. And that it's, it's less likely that the government will punish somebody for writing something negative. Well, up until recently, I think that's true. But now we're starting to see that as a problem where the, the press is being attacked and anybody who says something against the government. Now, obviously, it's not the whole government that's a problem. I mean, clearly, I'm speaking specifically about Trump, but he he attacks yeah. people for saying things that he doesn't believe. And that's how it starts. Yeah, that's right. That's how it starts. But it's, but it's not like sending people to prison. No, not yet. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, it's, it's kind of this, we can see pieces of this, but hopefully not to the extent because of the First Amendment protections that we've got. And uh, on the other hand... But we are, you know, this does hold true here to some degree. Right? No question. It's, it's, uh, not, it's not like we're immune from these problems by I any I think we're, we're further down the road than, than we care to realize. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't vote for Donald Trump, and much of what he does is uh, appalling to me. But um, 
I dealt with the press for almost 30 years in D.C., and uh, Mr. Trump is not lying when he says the press is uh, deceitful, deceptive, dishonest. I myself was the object of some press stories, and uh, other than getting two N's and two T's in the name Bennett, the rest of it was pure mm-hmm. fiction. And I learned that's how it, that's how it, that's how it goes. So pri- prior to Trump coming along, you had an ex- extreme erosion in confidence of the press. Uh, the press is now regarded uh, with contempt equal to the contempt people hold Congress in. So two of our institutions, the press and Congress, between 15 and 18 percent, uh, people believe them and the rest of us don't. Well, you don't sacrifice that kind of trust overnight. It takes a long time to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. With regard to free speech, uh, I would argue respectfully that one of the places where free speech is in greatest danger is on college campuses. The promulgation of speech codes, the uh, certain things you can't say, certain views you can't say. I've considered uh, writing a, a monograph on a subject and decided against it just because I don't want to have my house egged and my email accounts uh, clogged up with death threats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate that things like that do happen. It is. I know um, a lot of my colleagues and I, we talk about things like this all the time, especially, I don't know if especially is the right word, but in the humanities where we're focusing on those kinds of issues about you know people and how they live and all that stuff. Um, for I make a big deal in my classes about... Um, students being able to express their views um they as long as they're backing it up properly mm-hmm. you know it is said if you don't believe what i believe it's totally okay mm-hmm. because i know some students worry about that kind of thing mm-hmm. and i don't i don't lecture about my political views in class ever um but uh yeah i actually had a student years ago i was teaching about the holocaust and this one student uh wrote that the jews deserved the holocaust and that that was the hardest a challenge to my my theory about the way I teach ever because I was just wanted to give an automatic F for it. I was so angry, um, but I didn't. I I went through it and it turned out they didn't back it up well, so I could feel good about giving them an F because they earned an F. Um, but you know, people have to be able to express their views in college. This is the place where students learn what their views really are, mm-hmm. um, what the options are on thought. Um, and I know I have friends who lean all different directions and some of them they do focus on that and kind of pound in their ideas um their ideals but i know a lot of professors who don't do that too Mm -hmm. we're just teaching them how to think not not what to think i try hard not to and i tell them i'm going to try hard not to and i will inevitably fail and when i do fail i'll identify it as such you know as my view if i can't avoid expressing it uh, here it is doug i'm interested in your comment about the press so, and I'm also interested in your comment about power. Um, would you include the press in your comment about it's all about gaining power? Oh, unquestionably. Uh, perhaps more so than almost anyone else. So I've spent a life um, where um, different positions I've been in, I've been in the local media quite a bit. And, um, and I thought that You know, for local newspapers and local radio stations, uh, for the most part, you know, they really tried hard to do their very best. It's a kind of a community sort of a thing, and they're they're dependent upon the same community supporting them. Mm -hmm. But even with that, the the number of inaccuracies is pretty surprising. Mm -hmm. And and it's partly because you've got a, a reporter that may or may not understand the issue or the Mm -hmm. topic, trying to listen to somebody, interview somebody, and then write it down and publish it, it's a real challenge for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then then when you take it to the next level, which is, what if the reporter has an agenda? Mm. Uh, And and I've had a few experiences with that, but but as you said, this, this is where we end up saying, who do we trust? And 
One of the things with my students, uh, I tell them not to use news sources as their primary sources if they can find it somewhere else. I mean, if they're trying to make a point about the news, that's fine. But it it reminds me of the encyclopedias where you've got uh, one person trying to be a semi-expert on everything, and they can't. Even if they're trying to do it well, they can't be. So, um, yeah, it's just their view of it. You know, the, even if they're being as honest as they can about it, it doesn't mean it's completely accurate. And there are some news sources that are uh, more accurate than others. There's there's websites like Politifax that tries to sort all that out so people can see, okay, this one lies more than this one and some different sources out there. But people tend to get, have this emotional response to news and they don't like necessarily double check it. They're just like, oh my gosh, this thing happened and I have to be mad about it without checking sources. Well, and I, I have to laugh because every single year the university sends out an April Fool's joke. Oh, yes. And it's on April Fool's. And it's surprising how many people will read the heading and then send me an angry email <laughs> without having read the story. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just been, cracks me up. And I'd say, go back and read the story. I even had a reporter do that this last year. <laughs> we, we had this initiative. We, we, we said we had a dark sky initiative on campus, and there would be no lights on campus after dark. And um, people could find their way around with flashlights if they had to, but we wouldn't have any lights in the buildings or out of the buildings. And such a ludicrous thing to say, and to be on April Fool's Day. And at the end of a short article to say April Fools. But the number of people that I got sending notes to me, including a local reporter, caused me to think it doesn't matter how well written the article is. It's the it's the copy editor, isn't that mm. the position? The copy editor that that writes the title to the story that that's what everybody's reading. Yeah, a lot of times <laughs> they do just read the title, which isn't helpful. But I remember that article and I at my my first initial reaction was, wow, are they really doing this? Because there are people who fight vehemently for not having better lighting. So that part of it was actually not realistic, but um, plausible to me up to a point because like there's a problem with them not having enough streetlights in this town because people want to be able to see the stars. So right. it had enough truth in it that it was like, wait a yeah. minute. Yeah. I, I, I think if you read 1984, it is so grim and so free of any uh, of the humor of humanity that I, I've the re- reason I bring this up is I, there have been a number of articles this week about um, about comedians who are leaving the business because they are they don't it, it's too discouraging or they're too upset about uh, the current state of things that that they they can't make a joke about it anymore and uh uh, Jerry Seinfeld said he would play college campuses. Yeah, the ability to um, to have free speech that supports satire, that supports humor, uh, is I think one of the key that the, one of the key ways that proles can punch back at the government is by making fun of the government and and enjoying others who make fun of the government. Mm-hmm. And, and it's when when governments lose a sense of humor about themselves, totalitarianism has a real foothold. Well, it, it makes me sad that people would would say I, I can't find I can't find anything to make a joke about this. Uh, let me ask this question if I may. Uh, I, I said I Trump often appalled me and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes I, I think he's doing the right thing. Uh, has I've followed politics closely my whole life. Has anyone ever seen press treatment of a political figure such as Donald Trump has received? Well, I think, I don't know if it's exactly the same. I mean, I think Obama was treated really, really poorly. Um, it Not by everybody. No, but, I'm talking but, about the press. Yeah, the no, I, press. and I'm talking about mainstream press. But no, but um, honestly, I, I'm really of the mind that um, Trump's creating this culture himself. I don't, I don't think it's the press. I, I really don't. Just because, you know, the fact that he doesn't follow the law a lot of the time. More so than other politicians. I get that politicians are politicians or whatever. But, you know, he tries to change the laws to adjust to what he needs or wants. 
um, he lies more often statistically than any any other president ever has. So there's there's well, some people, reasons to be concerned. People people I I saw a rather amusing story in the New York Times, which is the source of many amusing stories to me, about how many times Mr. Trump lied uh, as opposed to Mr. Obama. Uh, you can keep your doctor, you can keep your health plan, was one, and my inaugural crowd was the biggest in history was one. The first from Obama, the second from Trump. I don't care how big Trump's crowd is, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is Obama absolutely trashed the U.S. health care system, sent premiums through the roof, all in the name of, or I would smile, the Affordable Care and Patient Protection Act. Yeah, I don't think everything was perfect with that by any means. I do think the difference is is that Obama really has had good intentions, and he is trying to work for people, not just himself, where Trump just seems to be using the government as his own like side business, which is concerning. See, I worked in Washington in the Obama administration, and I would like to quote Mr. Orwell. The party seeks power entirely <laughs> for its own sake. And in my experience, traveling around the world, doing business in places like Venezuela, Vietnam, China, the further left the party is, the greater is the power it seeks to consolidate. See, I find that really interesting. And I know at least, obviously, I, I've not worked in Washington. I don't know all of the higher levels of government. I don't, and I'm not trying to pretend that I do. But everybody I know who's liberal, um, well, just about everybody, um, and in smaller governments, they really are trying to work for other people, not for themselves. Uh, example? Oh, well, just, you know, like trying to get rights for women, um, you know, or trying to um Is there work a country in the world where women have greater rights than in this country? I think there actually are some. I've never found it. Like, uh, and I, I can't, like, actually quote anything, but I remember reading articles about the way um, in the Netherlands that, that there's actually some better things going on there than there are here. Um, but, you know, even if we have laws here, there's still problems with, um, you know, misogyny and uh, rape culture and all of those things are still perpetuated unofficially. So there's still this problem that needs to be taken care of. But um, as far as comparing it with other countries, I can't completely do that. I, th I think an analogy for this is the voting rights of Washington, D.C. And, um, and we saw this with the addition of new states through the civil rights, the Civil War era. Um, but when you, when you look at, uh, and I'd be interested, Doug, in your reaction to this, but there's been a lot of debate about whether or not to allow Washington, D.C. residents to um, vote for a senator, for example, or a congressman. They vote, they vote now for a congressman. They vote for a congressman. Yes, she's a non-voting member of the House. Eleanor Holmes Norton is her name. So they're voting for a congressman, but she's not really a Congress member. She can't, she can't vote uh, on final passage. She can yeah. vote in committee, yes. Why is that? Because D.C. is not a state. Oh, that's right. It's not a state. Um, but the conversation about changing the Constitution in some way or another to allow the residents of Washington, D.C. to have a senator to or to have congressmen, it seems to me that the real issue there is, well, will it be a Republican or a Democrat? Mm. There's no issue. It DC's ninety four percent Democrat. They voted ninety six percent for Hillary Clinton. So, it's not possible. For DC well, no, to... it's, not. it's uh, sixty four square miles of what I call a work free drug place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Gonna get but to, it goes to that power. It's thing. not going to get it's two like senators. We're not really trying to give them an equal vote. It's a matter of um, who's what party is benefited by it. Well, you. you you sequence them in. You you took Alaska and Hawaii, Hawaii reliably, predictably Democratic, Alaska reliably, predictably Republican. You put D.C. in. You've got two Democratic senators. You'll never have a, a Republican. And it it was intended that the federal district be insulated from the vicissitudes of state politics. Uh, it's a federal enclave 
intended to house the government. It was never intended to be a state. It's changed, though, for in terms of population. Yeah. Yeah, but it, but the, it will never be a state. Right. Right. It won't be because... It won't be because it would be an automatic win for one party. Right. And you can't ever get enough to make a constitutional amendment. No, uh, I don't think that's your circumstance. See. Well, it's interesting um, to talk about these issues in 1984 relevant to today and to get these different perspectives on it. Um, what would be the takeaway from this book? Um, What's the lesson we should capture from it? Uh, let's, there's several, but I think overall that we just we need to be aware of what is going on in our community at large. We need to be involved in it before it gets to a point where we no longer are allowed to. I think the lesson is that uh, people will happily cede liberty, probably the most precious thing they have, for security, sustenance, shelter. And it, as Carl Sandburg said, happens on little cat's feet very quietly. Uh, you say we should all have a right to health care. I certainly agree with that. That's very different from saying the government will determine what kind of health care you get and give it to you. That's true. And when things get hard, they will maybe take it from you. Uh, what is in government's power to give is in government's power to take. And I think we've seen an increasing movement toward uh, greater government involvement in every single aspect of our lives, education, health care, housing, nutrition. Some government involvement is inevitable and necessary and good. Uh, the vast majority of it, in my opinion, is... Uh, uh, harmful, uh, destructive, and inures to the benefit of those in government. I I think that uh, when you when you raise that issue, Doug, about how we're willing to give things up, give away our liberties for something that we value more highly, perhaps at the time, it reminds me of free speech. How many of our college students would give away? much of the First Amendment to not have any offensive statements made. Mm. Um, I, I, that's really interesting because we can, we can start down this road, and it's not government's fault. It's our fault. We start down this road by saying, for example, I don't want any hate speech at all. So that's hate speech is protected by the Constitution, the First Amendment. So we say, we don't want that kind of speech. And then once we say we don't want that kind of speech, then what's the next kind of speech that's taken away? And then the next. And what starts out with these great ideas that we can have a better society if we give away some of our liberties to government. But the end of the road is something that we don't, we're not able to predict, except that it usually gets worse. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it like that. And it's true because, you know, we can't just like stand back and watch people kill each other just because, you know, yeah. they have the right to say whatever they want or do whatever they want. Obviously, we have to have limitations on those kinds of things. But yeah, I don't think we look that far down the road sometimes. We're like, okay, this is an immediate need, which is the yeah. whole problem with everything. So again, if you go back to the proles, which is like the majority of people in the United States, everybody's trying to survive. And they don't take the time to do these other things unless there's this huge uprising. Uh, let, well, I'm saying that wrong, but let's say um, like if, if all the rights were taken away to vote, going back to voting, then people would have a fit and, and, and there would be an uprising. And of course, it's harder at that point to do something about it if the government took that away, which I'm not saying they would. I'm just giving it as an example. But um, when it's easier, we just kind of go, yeah, well, someone else is going to have to fix that. I'm busy, you know trying to get clothes for my kids or whatever it is that we're doing. And we just get hyper-focused on our own lives. If I, I, so I had a class, and this is, a, this is such an interesting topic to me, but I had a class a while ago, and, and this issue of free speech came up. And there was, an, 
There was a situation that had happened on campus where a student had made some really hurtful statements, um, constitutionally protected, but hurtful statements. And I remember asking my class, how many of you think that I, as the president of the university, should require this student to apologize um, and not allow those kind of statements to be made on our campus? And the, the percentage of students that hands shot up was really surprising. And then, then the next question I asked him was, do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> I am a member of the executive branch of government. And, and what you're telling me is, is that I, as a member of the executive, all teachers um, are executive branch government officials, actually. You're either legisl- if, you're, if you're getting a government paycheck, you're either legislative, judicial, or executive, and most of us are executive. Um, all of us in this room are. So I, when, in talking to this class, I said, you realize I'm a member of the executive branch, and if you give me authority to, to um, decide what speech is bad and which speech is not bad, don't you realize what you've given me? Mm-hmm. And if it works in your favor today, don't you realize it might work uh, opposite of your favor tomorrow? Yeah. You shouldn't give me this power, period. It, it shouldn't be there at all. But we tend, um, as you said, Doug, we tend to just keep giving it away because of something else we value. But we're not thinking to the end of the row. We've, n- we've not had to. We, we've not been deprived of it. So we don't really know what it is we have. People cede power to the state gradually in exchange for something and always with the understanding that they're getting more than they're giving. And one of the authors that had a huge influence on me was William F. Buckley. And I was, as I say, a very liberal young man, and I first started reading Buckley and wrestling with him. But on the subject of power... He said this, and I think there's more wisdom in here than we realize. I will not cede power to the state. I will not willingly cede more power to anyone, not to the state, not to General Motors, not to the CIO. I will hoard my power like a miser, resisting every effort to take it away from me. I will then use my power as I see fit. I mean to live my life an obedient man, obedient to God, subservient to the wisdom of my ancestors, not to the authority of political truths arrived at yesterday at the voting booth. That is a program of sorts, is it not? It is certainly enough to keep conservatives busy and liberals at bay and the nation free. I think there's some truth to that. Mm, that's interesting. I, You know, we've been talking about the takeaway from this book, I, and for me... Uh, just following up on what you were saying, Doug. Um, I, I'm a tech guy, uh, an early adapter. Um, always have been interested in that. It's it's part of what I teach every day here. And for me, uh, the little cat foot part of this is how much of our power we are ceding through the increasing intrusion of technology into our lives. It freaks me out. It freaks me out too. When I... I look at my phone and Facebook says, welcome to San Mateo. Uh, yeah. I don't want you to know that I'm in <laughs> San Mateo. I'll, I'll let you know, Facebook, if I want you to yes. know. And, and I understand that these are all settings and young people would roll their eyes at me about that. But they should be opt-in settings, not yeah, opt-out no, that's settings. True. I and, pick, uh, Steve, you're more sophisticated with this than I am. You know technology better than I do. I pick up this phone... And I look at it, and it says uh, one hour and 11 minutes to home. I hadn't told it I'm going home after this, but I am. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And uh, now when I walk into a room, there's a television in our home. If I turn it on, it doesn't come on to the program I'm going to watch. It comes on to the program Dish thinks I'm going to watch. And they're (laughs) <laughs> and it terrifies me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. this is a big thing that I talk about in uh, 
<laughs> like big I've teach a class about Big Brother specifically and then we've expanded to the conspiracy theories. And by the end of the class I have students completely paranoid. But um <laughs> one of the things I do for the very beginning of class is for those classes I will scour the internet for information, public information that, that about the students. So instead of them introducing themselves, I'll introduce them. And they just look horrified, like, how do I know these things? And it's all just Facebook or maybe something from their high school or whatever. It's not like I'm paying for an investigator. This is all right. open information. And they have no idea that they're putting themselves out there like that. Uh, another uh, example that's kind of weird we talk about are like CCTV in Britain, especially like in the London area where there's cameras everywhere. Great for, you know, the police to see if there was a crime, but they're also seeing everything that you do all the time. And is yeah. that really what we want? Yeah. The, the One of the, I think, as, as we sometimes on both sides of the aisle will look to Europe and say, well, they're doing this politically or they're doing this socially. Should we emulate that? One of the, one of the things I hope we never do is get to the surveillance state that Europe has become, but because it is, there is a camera. Well, on Steve, you if you're not doing anything wrong, why do yes, you have any well, problem I'm, with them watching you? Right. I'm, uh, I'm astonished. I know, that. Big Brother. Yes, right. that's right. That's yeah. right. And that's yeah. where it leads, right? It, it is. And, that's what and Big Brother would say. That exactly right. Yeah. If, if you're doing what you should be doing, then right. you should have no problem with right. us watching you. And if you're not, you're probably lucky we're watching you anyway. And that. I used to think that when I was younger. I remember thinking, well, you know, my life's pretty boring and. I'm not doing anything, but it didn't occur to me when I was younger that, you know, my definition or like maybe the reasonable person's definition of what is wrong might not be what the government's definition is wrong at some point. Yep. Well, I, I said in our earlier podcast about this that Mark Zuckerberg tapes over his mm. his camera on his laptop. Yep. And if Zuckerberg tapes over his camera, yep. he probably knows some something about surveillance that we don't know yep uh, and it yeah it, it that that to me that aspect of this book is maybe the most frightening we are we are not only ceding our power politically but we're ceding it to corporations and to others who uh, can not only not only use it in ways that they think will benefit us but also could exercise enormous blackmail level uh, power over us let me let me throw a a wild card into the deck here, if I may. As I thought about this uh, coming to me and uh, talk today, what about uh, Trump voters as the proles who finally did get organized and flex a little muscle? Oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. Realize I, uh, Donald Trump knocked off the three most powerful political entities in history, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and the establishment media. He knocked off 16 Republicans, uh, senators, congressmen, governors, as Republican as the name Bush itself. Uh, he knocked off Hillary Clinton. The Clintons had the most well-oiled, well-funded uh, political machine I have ever seen in my life. Uh, and I've seen it up close and personal. I predicted Mrs. Clinton would win. I, I said to my students, you listen to me, I'm a highly trained political professional, and there's no way Donald Trump will ever be president of the United States. Well, I don't think he would have been if it wasn't for like what they're investigating right now, so there's definitely that part of it. Well, but put, let's put that aside for a minute, and bear in mind Mr. Rosenstein's comment of last Friday, there was no allegation that any American was involved. Mr. Trump is an American, so for, there's no allegation that he was involved, according to Mr. Rosenstein. I'm passing no judgment on that one way or the other. What I am saying is uh, you have a professional political class in Washington. It's bipartisan. It doesn't really matter so much who's in charge as long as it's one of us, and I mean the old establishment guys. And here comes this guy. What was he, a real estate developer, a reality TV show host? I said to one of my students, I have, I've read about this guy in the tabloids, but right. I, I can't believe he's serious. And, and this student said to me, He's been in our living room for eight years through mm. the Celebrity Apprentice, and my family and I just love him. See that? I, I think I watched like two minutes of Celebrity Apprentice, and, and I've thought, never seen it. And that would be that was <laughs> enough for me to go, "My word, this man should not be in charge of anything." Yeah, a, a, but a, a bombastic, you know. A, a, but he he is as president he as is. he was on reality TV. He uh, is Christmas. precisely as he was. That's yeah. right. 
And I can tell you the Republicans are as worried about it as the Democrats. I'm sure that's but the right. people who aren't worried, and by Republicans, I mean establishment D.C. Republicans, 88% of members of the Republican Party approve or strongly approve of the jobs Trump's doing as of July 31, 2018. 88%. Who got him in there? And I would say, to a large extent, people who have felt alienated and shut out of the process uh, some attribute racial motivation, some attribute class motivation. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, here was a guy who stood up and said, look, you've been lied to, you've been taken advantage of. We're $21 trillion in debt, your taxes are high, your schools are poor, and I am not a career politician, maybe I can do something. Enough people believed that they elected him against the advice of everybody. Well, the, the, I think the concept of that is good. Um, but what I see happening, and, and it's not everybody, obviously, nothing that I'm saying is absolute, but I see a lot of people who are following him who they only get their news from him. That's it. And that that's the only, and they don't care because they don't have to think about it anymore. They're like, good, he's doing this. And then you say, well, what about, you know, some of the racist, misogynistic things that he's done? Well, yeah, I don't like that, but that's okay. Cause this, um, and so I do think there's a lot of, uh, just, Here's somebody who maybe I don't have to think about. I don't have to work so hard. And so they give that power away. And it could have been anybody. But, you know, that's how Hitler became in power. People were fed up. And there were just so many problems in the country. And so Hitler sounded good. Uh, Hitler was popularly elected, uh, duly elected in a, in a proper election, no question. With Mr. Trump, let me, let me try a little bit different one. Uh, with regard to the misogyny, uh, I was uh, in D.C. throughout the Clinton presidency, and President Clinton's indiscretions are well known. Uh, I was there when you could regularly read in the in roll call that uh, Senator Kennedy and Senator Dodd had thrown waitresses on the table at La Brasserie and were all over them, and nobody cared. Leon Weisenthaler at the New Republic was molesting and groping. Charlie Rose at CBS, nobody cared. What happened? That I don't know because I'll tell from you, my point Donald of view, Trump got elected, and Donald Trump was heard on a tape making an inappropriate remark with regard to women, and all of a sudden, the fact that women were mistreated was a major, serious issue. They lifted up that rock, and who came scurrying out? But see, that's half the thing. of Hollywood. It was half always of like East that, Coast. right? Right. But they, but the moral outrage wasn't there before Trump. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, that's that's part of the culture, the rape culture, or whatever you want to call it. It's women um, are treated like that quite often in many industries and government, and it should never have been like but that. Where was the Washington Post? I that where I was know. the New York Times? So my Doug, point is, it's not an issue of women's rights for the Post and the Times. It's a way to go after Trump. They don't care about women any more than they did ten years ago. No, I think it's the, a tool I think to the go culture's after Trump. changing that way. I think the culture is. I don't think the media is. Well, on that I'm not entirely positive. Obviously, I don't know how they're running things, but they're going to focus more on things that are important to people. So the more that we speak up about something, the more that they're going to follow up on that. This is getting fun. This is, <laughs> this is where it should be. Uh, good, good. This is fun. You've been listening to a very spirited version of Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University. We have been talking about the book 1984 with Doug Bennett and Joyce Arantino from our faculty here at SUU, and we hope that you've enjoyed reading that book and hearing the discussion. We also hope that you'll join us for our August book, which is The Ghost Map by Stephen Johnson, and we look forward to talking with you about that at the end of the month. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu. <laughs>